Um, good afternoon. There are six main uh, points to this presentation on embodied carbon in high rise. Firstly, I'm going to be looking at the environmental impact of construction materials from a general point of view, touching on the differences between embodied carbon and operational carbon, examining the impact height has on both of these. I'll then be looking at a case study, uh, 30 St Mary Axe, a gherkin in London, and showing a full carbon scale analysis of this building, before touching on the growing importance of embodied carbon in the future, and finally looking at some strategies to reduce embodied carbon in tall buildings. So high rise, like all buildings, are responsible for environmental impacts across their entire life cycle. So that's from the extraction of the raw materials in the ground, the manufacturing of those materials into components, the construction of those materials together, the operation of the building, and finally the disposal or recycling of the building at the end of their life. And the premise of this presentation is that too often sustainability only looks at one small facet of this, and that's the operational side. And what I'm going to try and talk about a little bit today is opening up this framework looking at the environmental impacts beyond operations, how important they are, and how we can reduce them. So how important are materials in terms of environmental impact? Well, this graph shows raw material consumption in the US. The blue is construction materials. Three billion tonnes of materials are used in the United States every year. The vast majority are construction materials massive resource depletion. If we look at annual world material production, you can see that it's dominated, again in blue, by ceramics, which in turn is, is dominated by concrete. Concrete, um, I find this an amazing statistic that as a human race, we only use fresh water more than concrete. I mean, that's, just in, that's amazing. Um, and concrete, the manufacture and production of concrete has a massive impact on the environment. So for every ton of cement you uh, produce, requires 1.5 tons of raw materials, 4,000 to 7,000 megajoules of energy. And the cement industry being responsible for 5% of all global anthropogenic uh, CO2 emissions. The construction of the built environment is also responsible for significant amounts of waste. So in the United States, again, uh, annual construction waste is 170 million tonnes, as shown on the right there. Um, that is 70% of municipal waste, so day-to-day -day waste. It's a massive amount. In the UK, 13 million tonnes of materials are sent to site every year, only to be thrown away before they're even used. So how can we begin to measure these environmental impacts? Well, there's a two kind of um, sides to the coin. There's embodied carbon, which I'm sure you've all heard of, which is the energy used or carbon emitted from extracting the raw materials, manufacturing the components, assembling the building uh, together, tran transporting those materials around, maintaining and repairing the building over its effective life, and then disposing of the building at the end of its effective life. The other side is operational um, energy or operational carbon, and that's the heating, cooling, the day-to-day -day emissions uh, related to running the building. And if you put these two together, you get the total energy footprint, the life cycle energy of the building, or the carbon footprint of the building. And when we look at the importance of these two, historically, it was always the idea that 80% of the buildings environmental impacts are related to operations, and 20% are responsible or due to the embodied elements of the building. And this is historically what we always thought, but this is changing. Current thinking suggests it's actually closer to a 60-40 split. So that it's almost 50-50. Although this is obviously dependent on a number of factors. It's dependent on the function of the building. It's dependent on where the building's located, what it's built out of. A supermarket, for example, very simple structure, uh, may have a very low embodied energy and a very high operational energy, such that it's more a 90-10 split. 
So what does the impact of height have on embodied energy? What does the impact of height have on the way we use materials and the way materials are responsible for environmental degradation? This is the results of a very famous study by Graham Trelaw from Deakin University, which is the embodied energy analysis of five buildings, ranging from three storeys up to 52 storeys. And you can see embodied energy per unit square metre increases with height. And you can imagine why this is. Structural materials, we use more of them as we go higher to resist the lateral loads. This has led many people to say that tall buildings are inherently un unsustainable. However, is this simply the case? Is it, can we say that tall buildings are more, uh, use more embodied carbon? Well, it depends how you measure things. This is another study, this time by Norman, looking at embodied energy of low-rise and medium-rise housing. The graphs on the left show embodied energy per square metre. And as you can see, the kind of single detached dwelling has a lower embodied energy than the high-rise. But if you measure per person, the high-rise has a lower embodied energy than the, um, the low-rise. And this is because more people live in a more compact lifestyle in high-rise buildings. So those who come out and say, now tall buildings are unsustainable, and I've read this widely because of the amount of materials used, it's not as simple as that. And in fact, there are many advantages and disadvantages to building tall in terms of embodied carbon and embodied energy. I'm not going to dwell on them all, otherwise I'll be here all afternoon, but they include reduced embodied energy per resident, as I just mentioned. Increased densities of cities can reduce infrastructure requirements, less motorways that require vast quantities of concrete, cement, asphalt, etc. Repetition of floor plates, facade, and other elements mean we can reuse formwork, reuse components, prefabricate the building. Tall buildings are generally renovated or refurbished rather than demolished, and I'll be talking a little bit about that later on in the presentation. There are disadvantages as well. Increased structural materials to build high, to resist lateral wind loads. Construction at height requires lifting the materials often hundreds of metres into the air, or as we saw this morning, maybe a thousand metres into the air. Uh, tall building construction often requires specialist materials or components that may not be available locally. Reduced net to gross efficiencies, so less usable floor area per piece of material. Uh, natural ventilation, for example, is often not possible without double skin facades. That's extra material. And there's limited opportunities for timber frame construction with high rise, although those of you who sat in the uh, student competition yesterday will have seen a, a 50 story timber high rise proposal. So maybe this is changing. Um, I'm now going to focus on the kind of middle part of the presentation, which is a case study of the carbon analysis of 30 St. Mary Axe, London. A lot of you know, will know this building. It's pretty famous. It's called the Gherkin. Um, 41 storeys above ground, 65,000 square metres. And in terms of materials, we've got about 12,000 tonnes of steel, about 40,000 tonnes of concrete, 1,000 tonnes of facade, and then you add on to that all the services and mechanical materials, the finishers, the fit-out, carpets, etc. And we can undertake a carbon analysis of this building. And this diagram here shows the initial embodied carbon in the building on the right, compared to one year of operational emissions. Uh, initial embodied carbon is just the, ini kind of the initial carbon required in building the building. It doesn't include things like refurbishment or renovation. The operational carbon emissions there are heating, cooling, lighting, computing, all small power loads as well. And can, we can see the comparison. So the embodied carbon in the building is worth about 13 years of operational emissions. And it's predominantly the structural elements, the elements in blue, your structural frame, your sub substructure, upper floors, that are primarily responsible for over 50% of the embodied carbon. However, as I say, that excludes the idea that we maintain and refurbish the built environment on a regular basis. Recurring embodied carbon then factors this into the calculation. It's the embodied carbon to maintain, refurbish and renovate the building over its effective life. We can see that elements such as the concrete foundation, the structural steel will last for the full lifetime of the building. 
But other elements such as the sprinkler systems, the timber doors, the toilet fixtures may only last for 50 years. The elevator systems and the facade may be 40 years. Right the way down to the plasterboard for only 10 years and the paint may be only 5 years. When we factor this into the calculations, um, we can see that structure is never really replaced. It may be maintained a little bit, but structure is there for the life of the building. The external envelope, as shown in the kind of yellow colour there, may be maintained once over its effective life or renovated once over the effective life. But then you've got elements like the services and the finishes which are continually maintained. And what this means is they build up in terms of environmental impact, such that elements such as the services and finishes are actually play a huge role in the environmental impact of the building. So looking again at the calculations, this is the embodied energy of 30 St. Mary Axe broken down by building element. And at the very bottom, you can see the structural frame is still the dominant uh, contributor to the building's embodied energy. But up towards the top, you can see building services and finishes, which are the second and third most largest contributor to embodied energy. And that's because of their refurbishment, the continual refurbishment and upgrade of these elements. So if we want to reduce embodied energy into our buildings, it's these three aspects or these three elements we should be focusing on. Structure, services, finishes. The next step is to compare this with the operational carbon over a 50-year life cycle. However, we've got to think about what operational carbon means. You know, we are decarbonizing our energy environment globally. There is a shift from non-renewable coal, oil, gas, to renewable energy around the globe. This means that operational energy and operational carbon is not static, it's dynamic. UK context, for example, where the 30 St. Mary Axe is based, this graph shows the carbon intensity of electricity in the UK. So that's how much carbon is emitted per kilowatt hour. Today, you generate one kilowatt hour of electricity and you're releasing half a kilogram of CO2 into the environment. However, the UK is um, shifting from oil and gas to nuclear and renewables, or plans to over the next 50 years. Now, this is an estimate, but it's relatively set in legislation. So whereas one kilowatt hour today is worth a half a kilogram of CO2, in 50 years, that will have reduced by 14-fold, such that you generate one kilowatt hour of electricity by 2050, and that will be worth 0.04 kilograms of CO2. And we need to factor this into our consideration of how we um, assess the built environment. All in all, this is the breakdown of the full life cycle of 30 St. Mary Axe carbon analysis. And you can see um, the building has 33% of its carbon footprint responsible from the embodied emissions, predominantly structure, finishes, and services, but still the vast majority, two-thirds, 67%, from building operations, even factoring in this reduced carbon. Altogether, it has a carbon footprint over 50 years of 225,000 tonnes of CO2. Now, that may sound like a lot. It may not sound like much. It's a quite abstract figure. So let's put that figure into context. That figure is equivalent to the annual greenhouse gas emissions of 44,000 cars, or the best part of 20,000 homes, or the best part of the carbon sequestered by 45,000 acres of um, pine forest. What's more, can we say that because embodied carbon is only equivalent to one third of the building's carbon footprint, it's not important and we should be focusing on operational carbon? I don't think that's the case, and I think that's not the case for two reasons, but I'm just going to talk about, just going to give us a little quote for the moment. Currently, we permit the development of tall buildings even when we know the materials from which they are built and their methods of construction and waste material from their construction are expensive in energy terms. In sum, the greenhouse gas equivalents of the energy embodied in tall buildings constitutes a significant proportion of the annual release of CO2. 
So there's two reasons why I think embodied carbon is actually more important than that one third makes out. Firstly, short-term targets. To, um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to combat climate change, we need to reduce annual carbon emissions globally by a massive amount in a very short space of time. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, suggests between 10 to 40 percent. At the bottom, there's other regional greenhouse gas emission targets. In the EU, 20 percent, America, 20 percent, et cetera, et cetera. And some of these are legis uh, legislation. They're set in law. To do this, we need to reduce carbon quickly. If you build a building today, the vast majority of its carbon footprint by 2020 will be embodied in its materials. We can see this with the gherkin. This is an analysis of the embodied carbon versus operational carbon from 2004 when it was built to 2020. We're in 2012 now, eight years on from its construction, and its initial embodied carbon, not even counting the recurring, is still worth 60% of its total carbon footprint. It's still the vast majority of its carbon footprint is due to its materials and construction. The second uh, reason I think embodied carbon is growing in importance is increasing energy efficiency. We're seeing numerous examples of tall buildings that claim to be phenomenally better performing than before. 50% below the baseline, 55%, 58%, moving towards this idea of net zero or carbon neutral. As we get more energy efficient, the importance of embodied carbon obviously increases. But also we have a terminology problem here, this idea of net zero or carbon neutral. Because net zero and carbon neutral only consider operational emissions. A carbon neutral tall building only considers this aspect of a building's life cycle. Surely it's more sustainable to open this up and to consider the full range of life cycle emissions. Perhaps the idea of carbon neutrality is inherently unsustainable. I'm going to finish the presentation by looking at strategies to reduce embodied carbon in tall buildings under three main headings. That's reduce, recycle and retrofit. In terms of reducing, we can look at structural optimization. Now, this happens and has been happening for tens of years now, but we're getting new technologies and new ways of doing this, taking out structural materials when they're not needed. The St. Francis Towers, for example, use a structural damping system, and this saves between 5 to 10 million in construction costs. It also means that rather than adding more material, using a technology such as damping means you can take material away. You save money, you save material, but you also save net to growth. Smaller columns, smaller shear walls. Everyone's a winner. The Shanghai Tower outside, I'm not going to dwell on this because I'm sure you've all seen this several times, but the form of the building is optimized to reduce wind loads and thus reduce structural material, saving about 60 million US dollars. But it doesn't have to be structure. We can look at fire engineering. Structural fire engineering is a process of being intelligent with where we put fireproofing. Rather than just going for a prescriptive approach and spraying fireproofing over every piece of structure, we can be clever with it. We can test the building, see how it performs, and only put the fireproofing where we need it. So this is an eight-story building in London, a case study. You can see on the left a photo of the building. And if you go with a prescriptive approach to the fireproofing, i.e. you spray fire protection and, in this, case, in this case, intramescent paint everywhere, you have an embodied carbon in the paint of about 300 tonnes of CO2. However, if you model this building and you work out where you can take away the paint, where it's not needed, this happens. You can actually end up with a building that's safer because we know how it performs in terms of fire, but also one that is more uh, economical, reducing the cost, and also one that has a reduced embodied energy. This has been described to me before as taking the fat out and putting the muscle into buildings. Passive design. Now, this is a controversial one, really. How can a building that has passive design reduce its embodied carbon? This is a Deutsche Post tower in Bonn. It's a naturally ventilated building for 70% of the year. It uses a double skin facade to facilitate that natural ventilation. Now, a double skin facade in this building is 70 centimetres deep. It's extra layers of facade. That's a significant embodied energy cost. 
However, on the flip side is the building's naturally ventilated and therefore they can remove the vertical air distribution shafts. They saved a thousand square meters of floor plate by remo removing unnecessary mechanical plant floor. You know, a one kilowatt chiller uses nine tons of steel, a ton of copper, and all manner of other materials. It has an embodied carbon of 300 to 554 gigajoules of energy. If we can be passive and remove all this servicing, we can reduce the embodied carbon and the operational emissions at the same time. The second strategy I'm going to touch on a little bit is recycled materials. Now, obviously, recycled materials have a lower embodied carbon or embodied energy than non-recycled. So recycled steel, 84% less. Recycled copper, 75% less. Recycled aluminium, 85% less. And if we use something like a fly ash replacement in concrete, we can reduce by about 34% the embodied carbon of concrete. Going back to the 30 cent Mary Axe, um, example. This is the initial embodied carbon in the structure, assuming typical recycled material rates. So in the UK, typically we recycle 47% of the steel. So this example has 47% recycled steel. This example has no recycled steel, i.e. all virgin steel. And you can see it's gone from equivalent of 7.7 .7 years of operational emissions to 10.3. Or we can use all recycled steel and 50% uh, fly ash cement replacement. And it goes down to 3.6 years. So why aren't we using all recycled materials? Well, there's only so much recycled materials out there. You can easily go out and you know, say, my building's 100% recycled steel. But all you're doing is taking that recycled steel off the market so nobody else can use it. At the moment, demand outweighs supply of recycled materials. The last topic I'm going to touch on is retrofit. Um, many tall buildings now internationally are, including global icons such as the Empire State, the Willis Tower, Taipei 101, are retrofitting and improving elements like the facade, the services, to make the building more efficient. This is also good in terms of embodied carbon, because it means you are saving, instead of demolishing the building, you save all the structural embodied carbon that's gone into the building in the first place. You're reusing it. You're recycling the building. But what's actually interesting is, in tall buildings, we do this a lot. Tall buildings are very, very rarely demolished, although one of my colleagues over there will be talking a little bit about how to demolish a tall building. But if you look at the statistics, you can see that this is the tallest 10 buildings ever demolished. This doesn't include the World Trade Center, which I would say is destroyed rather than demolished. But you can see 727 buildings of 200 meters or greater in height have ever been constructed. And only one has ever been demolished. One and a half thousand buildings of 150 meters in, in height or uh, greater have been constructed and only five have ever been demolished. Because tall buildings become global icons and become an inherent part of a city, and because probably they are quite difficult to uh, deconstruct and demolish, we are refurbishing, refurbishing them more than we do low-rise buildings. And to a certain extent, that helps the sustainable credentials of a typology in general. Thank you very much.